Alright, so uh, like I said, I'm John Hobbs. I'm an infrastructure engineer at Flywheel, uh, which means that I haven't done any front end or JavaScript in uh, several years now. But I'm not going to let that stop me. So this talk is about uh, the programming language Go and uh, how it intersects with JavaScript. Uh, so I like this one, this, uh, you know, funny tweet. Everybody likes funny tweets. Um, and the, if you're not familiar with Go, it's a, it's a typed language. Um, so everything has a type, and you have to deal with that. So what is Go4JS? Go4JS is a, um, a project uh, that uh, it's, is a compiler from Go to JavaScript. Um, and it is fairly complete. Um, pretty much any Go that does not include a C module um, you can compile it to JavaScript or transpile it or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's, it's targeted to run in, in all modern browsers. Uh, why would you do this? Um, a lot of people that use Go really, really like Go and uh, aren't really um, very well versed in JavaScript. Uh, you can uh, share a lot of code from your front end to your back end, or back end to front end. Um, you can use uh, the world of existing Go packages um, because there's nothing on NPM, let's be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I think part of the motivation is, is just because you can. Um, they did it probably just because they could. So I'm going to start with a bare minimum uh, example, and I'm going to try to explain things uh, if, as if you, you've never seen Go before. Um, I don't know how many of you have played with Go. Um, but it's a very C-ish sort of uh, looking language. Uh, so you write your Go using pretty much anything you want, um, including channels, uh, which is uh, Go's way of, of passing things between um, kind of their green threads, which are called Go routines. Uh, that compiles down to JavaScript. It bakes in a little runtime for managing the Go routine stuff and the channel stuff uh, in, in JavaScript land. And then you take your JavaScript and use it. Um, so this is like the most minimal uh, Go Go for JS program I think of, uh, and it's just a, a hello world. Um, and the uh, this right here is a build tag um, which is used by this command Go for JS serve, um, and it just says, hey, like I actually want you to build this file to JavaScript and and uh, serve it up. It's kind of like the hot reload. Well, not, it's not hot re reloading. That's I spoke completely wrong. It's uh, it'll compile on demand. Um, so I've got go for js serve running here, and I'll just go over to the minimal example here, and look at that. Hello from Go. Um, not terribly exciting right off the bat, but that uh, that is um, Go transpiled into JavaScript and running. Um, so that's in itself isn't super useful. You need to be able to interact with all the other uh, stuff in the JavaScript world. And so Gopher.js provides and other people provide bindings. Um, so you can use things like the DOM, XHR, uh, React View, all these things uh, from Go as if they were Go. Like you, you don't have to think about JavaScript at all. You just have these Go structs and Go functions, and uh, you can use it all from Go. So the next example is going to be the DOM binding. <clears throat> so uh, this is just a thin wrapper uh, around the DOM API uh, to let you, you do DOM things. Um, and by the way, feel free to stop me if you have a question at any point. Um, I don't have that much content, so questions will stretch out uh, if we need to. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, you can probably figure out what's going on here. Um, we're using the DOM package, getting the window document, and hanging on to that, and then you're calling get element by ID. Um, and because um, JavaScript is not really typed the same way that uh, Go is typed, you, you have to do these. Um, uh, you have to basically cast them into 
what you know it is. So like, I know target up here is a div, so I make it into a div. Um, and then I know click me is a button and yada yada. Uh, this is adding an event handler um, that when you click click me, it will uh, use the format package, which is part of Go, Go's standard library, um, and the time package to get a timestamp, format it the same way it would in Go, stick it in the um, div I just created on line 19, and then append it. Yes? Question. <laughs> Um, so what's the difference between the star, the, like the star DOM, yes. and the event space DOM? Um, okay, so uh, in Go there is the concept of pointers. So if you uh, have ever done C or C++, um, this is a reference to a DOM element rather than the like the actual memory segment, like the DOM element itself. Okay. So yeah, this is casting to a pointer of HTML div element, um, and this is like an actual, they just send you the whole event. So, okay. that's a good, good point. And like I said, I, I haven't written much JavaScript in a long time, but I have been writing Go, so I'm coming at this from a Go angle. Um, so, for sure, ask for a clarification. So here's my DOM demo, so we're going to click me. There you go. Look at the beautiful timestamp formatting you get by default and go. Um, and you can, you know, click as many times as you'd like. All right. <clears throat> Next up is uh, network requests. Um, so uh, XHRs are hard. Like, who uses XHRs? Uh, whereas in Go, you have this nice synchronous concept of a net HTTP client request. Um, so this is using part of the standard lib, which is um, net HTTP, and it's, uh, so we're, we're saying get these tweets, um, the response is a go object, um, and error is, you know, an error code or error message, um, and on that response object there's status code, there's body, um, these are all very um, things that if you wrote go you'd, you'd interact with the net HTTP client a lot. Um, but this is, and IOUtil is another standard library package um, that does things like read all. So um, if you were writing Go, this would be read all, like response body would be uh, like a file handle, and read all would just pull it all out into a byte array. The point here is this is very normal idiomatic Go. Um, and if we come over here, uh, net HTTP demo. Oop. Oh no! No oh, no! Never mind. We're good. We're good. Uh, mismatch between localhost and 127. Uh, anyway. Okay. So hold on. Ooh, they are not working. So here's the uh, here's the um, Twitter search results, which is coming through a proxy uh, because. Twitter search API doesn't do JSONP or anything, but um, anyway, it did a net HTTP request and went over. Um, and, oops, the uh, fun bit is, um, so if we do, this is that the code for that, right? This is our, that code I just showed you um, with, you know, importing library and stuff. If I actually run that as, um, as a Go file, it, it does the same thing. So that, that code runs at, in Go4JS, in JavaScript in your browser, and the same code runs just straight regular Go. Um, so. so does that compile to a synchronous, what, what is that using to make the network request in the browser? Um, so in the browser it Compiles. It does use an XHR under the cover. Oh, okay. um, Go for JS kind of you know covers it up and it, it makes it look like it um, is just using the library directly. Okay. Um, so there's a, I mean there's a lot of magic inside. Yeah. Uh, however, um, there is a caveat there in that um, when you bring in the net HTTP package, there is no like 
code pruning in Gopher.js, so you also bring in a full HTTP server stack, uh, as well as a TLS stack. So um, you actually want to use the XHR bindings, uh, because if you look down here, the net HTTP version is uh, <laughs> almost 7 megs, XHR bindings is 132K. <laughs> so uh, here's the, the XHR version. Um, it's, it's, again, it's, it's wrapping the JavaScript H XHR um, object and you know, doing, doing a little bit of stuff. And <clears throat> oddly enough, it's less verbose. That's not oddly. Go is very verbose. Um, but it, it uh, works the same way. What am I looking for? Oh, yeah, Twitter. That's, that's the wrong one over here. So a lot of work just to show you the same thing. Um, but this time, uh, because it was all done in JavaScript, instead of the big blob of string, we've got the actual JSON, like parsed JSON. Minor difference, um, and it's, that's just really just a feature of the XHR package. Um, so yeah, maybe don't bring on all of net HTTP <laughs> for your XHR requests. This is down to the point, but was that first request from net HTTP synchronous? Uh, yes, so that is, uh, they are actually both synchronous. Oh, the okay. XHR bindings will, uh, will turn it into a, a synchronous request, but uh, you can use Go routines to make it run asynchronously. Oh, cool. Messy, but it works, so. All right, <clears throat> so there's lots of existing bindings, um, but obviously we all have JavaScript that we have written or want to use that doesn't have a binding by default. Um, and so this is an example of that, of how you, how you create your own binding for something. So js to do.txt is uh, an old project for the to do.txt um, format, if anybody uses that for their to do's. Um, it's just like a plain text to-do list format. Um, and this is a library that can parse it and um, spit it out and whatever. So <clears throat> the, the core part of that library is this to-do text item object. Um, and so to uh, model that in Go, we create this struct and we have all the same um, fields that the uh, JavaScript item or object would expose. So we've got text priority, uh, complete, completed, um, and all of these are uh, mapped magically for us by Gopher.js using these tags that tell it, you know, text should, is a string and should match up with the property of text on object. Um, it will not, like, automatically discover these for you. You have to declare them so that um, all this is checked at compile time. Next, we create a uh, initializer to make a to do dot text item, um, and this is some Gopher JS magic that says uh, get the to do dot text item uh, in JavaScript land and call new on it. Um, JS dot global is interesting in that when you're running in the browser, that is window. Um, when you're running in say Node, it's a different it depends on where you're running, that global will change, but it's just whatever is the, I don't know the JavaScript term for it, but like the global object of that runtime. Um, and then we're gonna add a uh, struct method, uh, which is parse here, um, and, and so we have this to text item here, and then we're gonna call, we'll uh, hop over to JavaScript, run a call with our parameters and stuff, and then return whatever JavaScript does. Um, same thing here, except we're casting the return to a string. And then when we use it all, um, we can forget about all that and just say, like, pretend this is pure Go and do a to -do, new to-do text item. Uh, that'll instantiate it in JavaScript land, call parse, do whatever we want with it, and um, we have a binding for our JavaScript library. Rich. So, proof that I'm not lying, I guess. <laughs> uh, any 
Any questions there? I don't know, that, that was a lot, I think, but, yeah. Uh, so, how about going the other direction? What if I write something in Go and I want to expose it to other JavaScript modules? Um, that's where this thing, uh, this function called JS make wrapper comes in. And what, uh, so in Go, um, the like public or private uh, classification of a, uh, a method or a uh, field on a struct is based by whether it's capitalized or not. <clears throat> so when you call, so I've made this little router object um, and it's just a map of a route name to a, a target. Uh, but these are all, these are both capitalized, so when I do JS make wrapper, it does reflection and it says, here are all the public, public methods of that struct. I'm going to create an object that also has public methods that automatically map back and forth. Um, so you can expose individual functions, um, but it's, it's a lot easier to make, use this make wrapper. Um, and it just does that, all that for you. Uh, and then to uh, expose that, I take this, um, I, I use that JS global again, which is the window object in a browser, and I set the property of router to my new router function, which um, is right here, and it, it makes, does the make wrapper and, and returns one. Uh, and then from JavaScript, you can just call it because it's now it's on the global, uh, it's on the window, it's window.router, but you can obviously drop window there. Uh, and then you have access to something you wrote entirely in Go. So there's a hello world. Uh, and you can see right here, I also call it with a route that does not exist. Um, and you get a null. Why it's a null and not undefined, I don't know. But Uh, so the next topic uh, I have is Vecti, and Vecti is a project to make a React-like um, framework, but entirely in Go, uh, and all using Go for JS to expose it. Um, it is super unstable. It's, it's not <laughs> uh, it, like to say it would have bad docs. It would have to have docs. So um, I'm sure there's there's a ton I don't know about it, uh, but it does. It does do some neat stuff, uh, and again, it's got a lot of the same goals as Go for JS. As you can, uh, you can use your Go and uh, throughout. So this is a minimal Vecti um, Hello World. Um, so uh, it's it's a lot like um, a lot of the, the kind of frameworks where you um, you declare these components and then you. Uh, tell them how they render, and then you, you glom them together. Um, so here's my hello world component. Um, this Vecti render body will uh, remove your body, current body tag and render whatever component you have here. And then every component in Vecti has to have a render method that matches this interface, um, and it returns component HTML. Basically, it returns a DOM element. <coughs> Um, and then this is a helper to make a body element, um, which we need because we're taking away the existing body element. Uh, and then this vecti.markup is kind of how they, um, you inject stuff into the uh, element that you're like the DOM element that you're currently building. So this is saying, you know, add, this whole line is saying add the class vecti root container to my body tag that I'm, that I'm returning. And then this is make me a text node that says hello world. Um, and so when you run that, surprisingly it says hello world. Um, and if you look at this, we've got our class of vecti root container um, and not much else. You got the text node that you asked for. So when it imports that, those libraries into Go, it's mm -hmm. doing that directly from GitHub? Uh, no, that is how, this is how you specify, um, how you specify, uh, like, unique packages in Go. Um, there's a tool called Go Get that will actually, by default, it uses it like a URL and it'll download it 
from Go or from GitHub. Uh -huh. um, but under the covers, um, so you have a uh, uh, Go path, which is you can have it be whatever you want. But inside of there, you've got uh, source. Oops, no. This is I'm too deep. All right, so inside your Go path, you've got source, and you've got um, the these. It, so it's it's a tree from there. Wow. So I could put anything I want in here, yeah. and I could, but I would access it based on that package import path. Um, so I can have two packages that are both named DOM, but as long as they have a unique path, I can use them both at the same time. Um, so yeah, it's it's. Uh, so those are just folders, folder names. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, but you can also kind of map them to um, repos because if you like, if you go to it, it is there. Okay. So. Um, so yeah, hello world. Uh, and so you can also, instead of just returning text here, you can uh, also return child components. So uh, I've this is. Basically the same code I showed you, except now I have this image component struct, and then uh, it has its own render, where I, uh, inside of a div, I add an image with a source of the value on the image component, and then a span with the text of the caption. And then up here in my hello world component rendering, I'm, instead of rendering just the text hello world, I'm also returning the image component, um, and when I I create it, I say, you know, I want the image to be this gopher.jpg and the caption to be flight ready gopher. So if you run that, it's a gopher and the hello world. Uh, not terribly exciting so far, um, but there's also um, event binding and uh, partial re rendering. So this is the same thing as the first one. But uh, now I've added this uh, an input uh, input tag with element input, um, and then I have it tied to uh, a uh, field on my my hello world component struct called hello what, and then we we bind the input uh, event to get the value of the input field, update the hello world component with that string and then re-render that particular component. So, uh, so now you get that. It's one-way binding. <clears throat> Can um, you the dev tools? Hmm? Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you want me to point it at? I just want you to type stuff in there. See how the re-render works? Oh, OK. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, so that's as far, basically, as I've gotten with Vecti. Um, I cannot, like I said, there's, there's, there's no docs. Um, I, I believe there is kind of an observables or a two-way binding thing. Uh, I just can't find it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm not using this for anything serious, so I, I haven't really like dug into it there. So does that do? Like smart subcomponent re-rendering or whatever. Like if you change a property that's like a super low child mode, it'll only update that one count node and not the whole entire. So it won't re-render the entire component. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure how the like automatic binding stuff goes, but um, you can call this vector re-render on any component, and it will re-render just that component. Just what changed? Mm -hmm. Um, and I haven't the faintest what goes on behind the scenes to do all that, but um, I do know it can be re render just one sub child component if needed. So um, now this is my example of gluing everything together. Um, so this is going to use the uh, XHR stuff and the uh, uh, Vecti stuff. Uh, and so I declare a page view, and it's got a bunch of sub uh, sub views of tweet views, and they each have a uh, text, a name, a screen name, and avatar um, uh, properties. Uh, so 
uh, so we create our page view, we set that as our body element, and then we call refresh. Um, I don't have the code here, I can pull it up, but refresh is just that XHR code I showed earlier. Um, and then when the XHR comes back, it, it populates that, um, this tweet view. It just makes a bunch of tweet views with the text, the name, the screen name, and avatar filled out. And then this is a render for the tweet view. And it is a, a list item with an image and um, lots of verbose things to say, uh, render this tweet view, which looks like that. So um, we could uh, probably find a way to re-render one of these subchilds, but they're child components, but um, yeah. So this is all uh, written in Go and uh, spitting out a little app thing. Uh, so there's other stuff uh, out there with Go and JavaScript. Uh, there is a WebAssembly Go compiler backend that is a work in progress but almost complete, um, where instead of this transpiled uh, JavaScript blob, you would get a WebAssembly, uh, again, also blob, um, that does a lot of the same stuff. Um, and uh, that has all the limitations of WebAssembly, but also the benefits of WebAssembly. Uh, there's another Go to JavaScript compiler called Joy. Um, it has some different uh, goals, uh, and it is it is no not anywhere near as complete as Go for JS, um, but uh, that could eventually be a better. I think it could be a better compiler than Go for JS. Um, this uh, JSGo.io is a service that um, you can uh, pass it a, a Go package. And it will, um, like, it will compile it for you, and then uh, serve up a minified, um, oops, a minified URL for you, um, which is kind of a nice service. So this is that minified, um, my minimal example done there. Um, so that's that's a neat thing. That's, uh, and then this uh, goplay.space. So. Uh, Go has a, they call it the Gopher Playground, um, and it's a, it's a web um, environment where you can type in Go code and hit run, and it'll off on its servers, compile it and run it and you know, spit it out for you. Um, somebody made a much better looking one, um, and this is made with Vecti, um, and is far too large to, uh, like, I haven't... I haven't dug in because it's like it's a way too big of a project to just look at, uh, but this would probably be the place to find all the Vec D tricks. Um, so, uh, and then I have shameless plug that there is a meetup for Gophers um, on the twenty seventh. If you are interested in Go, you should come. Uh, that's all I got. Uh, all the code and slides and stuff is available uh, on GitHub. Want to dig a little deeper or mess with it? Woo. Do you want to take any questions? Yeah. Questions? questions? Yes, sir. So, what are you using Go for? What are you doing with it? Um, so, I have some very small projects that I'm trying to get in at work in Go. Um, and then, other than that, it's just. Uh, Personal projects, uh, and I'm not I'm not using Go for JS for anything. Um, I just really like Go. So, so I mean, what practical applications are you doing? Um, they're they're uh, so I um, gosh, uh, Go is kind of exploding right now. It's like uh, getting very very popular. It is so uh, at work. I, I work on uh, distributed systems, um, so I, I use Kubernetes, uh, which is written in Go. Um, and so I've got some uh, custom resource controllers um, there in Go, um, and like we're wanting to replace some bits and bobs, but it's it's uh, used a lot right now for like system stuff. Um, so Kubernetes is a uh, container orchestration system that like schedules Docker containers on different machines, um, and so it's it's used a lot there. Um, 
personally, I, I use it for, um, I can, I'm, I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to plug, if that's okay. Uh, I, so, um, I got uh, my eldest daughter a egg incubator for Christmas. Um, uh, Do you have a picture of her? Uh, and uh, so when, when we bought eggs, um, there's, uh, the so egg incubator holds, uh, holds seven, and you can only buy them in the group of ten, uh, and then they actually sent us twelve. So uh, not wanting to let fairly expensive hatching eggs go to waste, I built this. Um, so these are fertilized eggs? These are fertile eggs. Um, we're got ten days left before the hatch. Um, and so this is a Raspberry Pi that's running a, a Go uh, service, uh, and it is reading from uh, these two DHT11. These are um, temperature and humidity uh, sensors, and then this is a temperature thermocouple that is uh, red. It's done through a Max uh, amplifier, and so it's a temperature sensor too. Um, and so off screen, there's a light bulb that's connected to a relay. Um, so the ideal temperature is about 38 degrees, ideal humidity is about 50%. Way under on that, I need to go home and add water. Uh, but the temperature is controlled by that relay, so the GO program reads the sensors. If it's getting too hot, it will turn the light off. If it gets too cold, it turns the light back on. Uh, but it also packages up the humidity and uh, temperature and ships it off to an HDB <coughs> server. Um, because you have to graph your temperature for, you know, months. Um, Why go through that much trouble? Nest thermostat, you could do it. Well, but this is more fun. <laughs> um, and then this page is actually served by a Go web server, um, and it uh, I have terrible, terrible internet, so this image is, is uh, pulled from my, that Raspberry Pi, uh, like every five seconds. Um, I could make it a lot longer because there's nothing going on here. Um, uh, previously, I had I had a webcam done the same way, written in JavaScript. Um, that was for when we had chicks. Um, so you you years put ago. this together? With the yeah, I did all this. A, mm -hmm. Yeah. And how much does it cost those? Uh, these are like under a buck. Um, the so max less, less than a nest is what you're saying. Yes, much less than an S. A Raspberry, I have, I have a Raspberry Pi, like, uh, B or something. It was like 20 bucks five years ago. They're, they're only like 20 or 30 bucks now and way more powerful. Um, the thermocouple is like uh, a couple bucks, so, yeah. That's good. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's, you know, 40 bucks in parts and uh, $500 in man time, I guess. Or something. <laughs> How long did the eggs cost? The, the eggs are a little bit less than five bucks each, which is five why I built each. a com uh, yeah. So what do you have to do to fertilize the eggs that you buy from the grocery so, store? Well, you can't fertilize the ones from the grocery store. Oh, you can't. Yeah, you have to order these special, um, and they are... Uh, so they have to be fertilized before the chicken lays the egg? Yes. Yep, oh. so the rooster and the chicken do their thing, and those are <laughs> When a rooster and a chicken yeah. really love each other. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, and then... Uh, so how many roosters do you need in a... One rooster can do a lot of work, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of chickens before. Um, yeah, so we candled eggs uh, a couple days ago, and this little blob right here is the embryo. So did you get any hatchlings yet? Nope, uh, they take 21 days to incubate, and uh, we're cam is live, right? March 15th, and then we'll have the live camera uh, feed of the so baby chicks. So you're going to build like a chicken coop in your backyard? Uh, yeah, well, I've got, um, I actually live on an acreage, and we've got a barn, so oh, I'll go perfect. in there. Oh, perfect, perfect. Yeah. So, so that you get is, brown eggs? Huh? You're going to get brown eggs? Uh, brown, and, and uh, if they hatch, blue. Oh, see, the, the lamp's off, and it's very dark in the basement, so... But that's yeah, that's an example of the practical go from the go that I've done. Uh -huh. so. I think the the big one I've run into is um, I don't know if you're familiar with static site generators, but Hugo yeah. is a big static mm -hmm. site generator. It's like maybe one of the most popular static site generators out there. So Hugo, it's good. It's a good project. Super fast. Yep, yep. Cool. So thank you.
Thanks for having me.